Okay, hello everyone. Uh, this is Muhammad Hussain speaking. Uh, this is uh, the first time together in uh, an uh, live broadcast with an English uh, language with our guest today, Mr. Manoj Nair. And uh, this is me, Muhammad Hussain, again and again. I hope you are not to get bored uh, from my uh, uh, <laughs> from my continuous appearance via LinkedIn and uh, Zoom meeting. Today we will talk about FedEx again. Uh, but in English, and uh, we have our new guest and our new lecture, Mr. Manoj Nair. I will introduce him and I will introduce the lecture. Then I will leave him to continue uh, with you. I see that we have a lot of uh, international friends today. Uh, all, um, actually, they are friends with Mr. Manoj, uh, with an Indian uh, speaker or Urdu, I think there is no Indi Indian language it's called Urdu, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Just a second. All right. Today we will talk about construction contract management and introduction to FedEx conditions of contract. Uh, especially we will talk about FedEx Red Book 99 version. Uh, our speaker today is Mr. Manoj Nair. He's a well-known solicitor from India. Let me give you a brief about his huge bio. Actually, I was interested when I saw it at the first time. So let's speak about it uh, fast because it has a lot of pages uh, that the meeting won't uh, be enough just to introduce him. Uh, Manoj Nair is a partner with SVM Contract Consultants based in Mumbai, India. He has over 20 years of professional experience in consulting and training. He is a faculty with Global Institute like Global Academy in Australia and FDB Singapore, Informa Dubai, KBMG Germany, no, uh, Education Unit of course, Knowledge Academy UK, LCT, GTC Group in UK, BVS Malaysia, Qatar Skills Academy, and uh, Khamiji Training Institute in Oman. Uh, of course, I will bypass some of uh, the points uh, for Mr. Manoj. Uh, he has extensive training experience and has till date conducted 250 plus corporate training on topics like contract drafting, contract negotiation, contract procurement management, managing outsourcing contracts, proposal writing, statement of work, vendor management, negotiation for supply chain managers, FedEx conditions of contracts, US FCBA and UK Bribery Act, anti-money uh, laundering and uh, counter-terrorism financing, business case writing, bankruptcy laws, claims management, negotiation, foreign exchange and management act, and finally, corporate governing, including mergers and acquisitions. Few of the companies that he has provided training are Qatar Petroleum, ETA, Ascon in Dubai, Loda Group, Khatib and Alami, KSA, Unistar Contracting Company, Microsoft India, Alstom India, Tata Bar, of course, Skoda India, Atos India, Bharti AXA, and a lot of companies worldwide. Mr. Manoj has a huge experience as an international solicitor and international instructor. Uh, he's a solicitor in Supreme Court in England and Wales. He has an LLB, become professional certificate from the George Washington University School of Business in contract management principles and practice and managing outsourcing contracts. Um, I think I will stop here, but uh, Mr. Manoj can tell us more about himself if he wish uh, when I deliver the mic to him. I don't want to take uh, a lot of time from the lecture. Uh, let me give you a brief about today's lecture and next week. By the way, this is not uh, one lecture. There will be another lecture, lecture uh, or a free webinar next week at the same time, 6.30 Cairo local time. And I know it's a midnight in India, so I hope you got your coffee before this meeting <laughs> to continue with us. Uh, the meeting won't, more, won't be more than one hour. Uh, we will leave uh, 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers from everyone. And I wish you prepare your answers in English because I'm not in the good mood to translate from Arabic to English. So <laughs> if anyone has a question during the lecture, you just have to write it down or use Google Translate. Uh, we will start talking uh, in this night on this webinar uh, regarding fitting, uh, fitting conditions of contract, especially the red book. Uh, we used to hear about contracts from engineers, uh, 
uh, or from FedEx, from engineers uh, for the previous year, uh, especially engineer Maggit Khulusi and a lot of uh, well-known engineers in the Middle East. I think this is the first time we talk about FedEx contract from the perspective of uh, a solicitor. Uh, I know that we had, uh, 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 let's say, a mutual uh, engineer and solicitor called Mariam Al-Awa. Uh, so we cannot consider here a pure solicitor or a pure lawyer, but Mr. Manoj is a pure solicitor or lawyer. So uh, let's listen uh, carefully with another perspective to the FedEx contracts from uh, Mr. Manoj. You have the mic, Mr. Manoj. Thank you, Mom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you on the Construction Contract Management and FedEx uh, introductory workshop. Um, I think I don't need to introduce myself because Mamad has uh, introduced, uh, given a very uh, brief introduction, and I think that's uh, good enough. What I will do is uh, I'll directly take you to the course outline, how the course outline would look. I'll explain some. Uh, what I'm going to do in the main course as far as the construction contract management is concerned. Uh, I'll also share with you um, a slide on liquid damages, which would be a learning curve for all of you who are here as to what is an LE and the importance of liquid damages in construction contracts. So that's a takeaway for you guys from this workshop. And let me just take you to the course outline. Uh, let me share my screen with you. Just give me a second, all of you. You have the ability to share the screen. Yeah, I'm, I'm just sharing my screen. I hope all of you can see my screen. This is the construction contract management course outline, which I'll be talking about in a few moments. And if you what can we see learn... the screen, uh, sorry, if you can see the screen, just comment in the chat, especially our friends on LinkedIn, because sometimes we miss uh, your uh, comments. Okay, Mr. Manoj, sorry. Sorry, I, I guess all of you can see my screen, right? Mamad, you can see yes, my screen. Yes, I can right? see. All, of you can see. all right, great. I think I believe all of you can see my screen. Thank you. If you guys have any questions when I speak, you can just put in the chat box. I'm okay with that. And maybe uh, I'll respond as I speak, or maybe in the last 15 minutes, I will, I will address those questions. Now, what does a construction, or construction contract management course look like? The first thing that we will talk about is uh, some basics of contracting. Now, here, my intent is not to make you all champions of contracts, but just to give you a flair as to when does a letter of intent, a letter of intent is a very important document for those in contracting, especially when you're doing construction contracts. So I'll be speaking about when does a letter of intent become a contract, whether a letter of intent is an agreement or a contract, that's a very, very important thing. When you issue RFP, RFQ, ITB, expression of interest, what are the best practices that you should be following when we talk about all these things? Now, are these documents contract or are they agreements or are they an invitation to contract? So I'll be speaking on uh, the, the first module talks about all these things. I'll also be sharing with you uh, something like, uh, what is a letter of tender? What is a letter of acceptance? A letter of award? So, you know, there's a lot of confusion between construction. And my experience has been in the last few. You know, when I, when I run these workshops in construction contract management, I've seen people have confusion. Uh, when do you issue a letter of acceptance? Does a letter of acceptance create a binding obligation as far as the contract is concerned. When do you issue a letter of acceptance? You know, so there is, sometimes I've seen there is some confusion and to, to bring in clarity and to bring in, I'll be sharing with you best practices when you write these kind of documents, like when do you, when you issue a letter of intent, what are the best practices to ensure that you protect the interest of your company? Now, that is something which, will, which I'll be sharing with you when I run the first module, which is some basics on contracting. Very, very important for those in construction industry uh, to understand the basics as far as letter of intent, letter of award, letter of tender, and letter of acceptance. I'll also be sharing with you some samples where you can see how it is prepared. So when I share the FIDIC uh, book with you, I'll be sharing with you the, the samples, how it looks. You know, How does a letter of acceptance look? How does uh, a letter of tender look? I can share that with you. A uh, letter of intent is not there in FIDIC, but I can share that with you I can share with you what are the best practices as far as writing a letter of intent is concerned. Now, uh, the second module that we talk about in the in the uh, construction contract management is talking about risk clauses. How do I transfer risk in a contract? You know, I, I'll share with you something very important. One of the primary primary reason 
that companies enter into contract. One is to get to get to make the contract a legal binding agreement. Second is to ensure that uh, the scope is understood properly between the parties. And third, and the very most important thing, is to ensure that risk is transferred, controlled, transferred, and distributed. This is what contracts do. And I'll be sharing with you the secret. You know, how is risk transferred in a contract? From the client to the contractor, contractor to subcontractor. And this is what these clauses do. I'll be sharing with you what an indemnity is. Indemnity is a very, very important risk transferring clause. I'll be sharing with you what an assignment is. The difference between assignment, delegation, subcontracting, very, very important. For those who are contractors, what is the importance of a limitation of liability clause? How do you write a clause, a limitation of liability clause in a contract? What is the position of a limitation of liability clause in FIDIC is something which I'll share with you. And I'll also share with you some best practices. How do you write, not, not how to draft them, but some pointers I'll be sharing with you, which will ensure that your interest, your company's interest, your organization's interest is protected by putting it in the right manner. So that's something which I'll be sharing with you. I'll also be talking about third-party liability. This is again very important. Uh, I'll be talking about third-party liability insurance. It's something which your, uh, your, your car insurance and CGI insurance takes care of. But I'll be explaining to you with case laws as to what is the impact of a third-party liability. So something which is very important for those in construction contract management to understand the importance of third-party. You really can't ignore the importance of third-party liability cover as far as construction contracts are concerned. Uh, you then have force majeure. Force majeure is a very important clause. Uh, and you will see that sometimes, uh, you know, companies goof up with, uh, you know, extension of time to be granted. Uh, what is the process as far as force majeure is concerned? Uh, force majeure is the most copy-pasted clause. My experience as a solicitor is it's a copy-pasted clause. People don't pay attention to the force majeure clause, but it could have a cost impact on your project. And I'll be sharing with you best practices how do you write a force majeure clause? Uh, what should be in a force majeure resumption of services to ensure that you know the other party does not take advantage of the contract by just saying it's a by just invoking the force majeure clause? Moving on from there, I'll be talking about consequential damages, which is again very important. Uh, I can I can just give you a, a tip. Please ensure that in your contracts you have a clause which says that your company is not responsible for any consequential loss. I'll be sharing this consequential loss, I'll be, I'll be explaining this clause to you along with the case law so that you guys have an in-depth understanding on the subject as far as consequential loss is concerned. I'll also, I'll also be explaining, I will also be explaining to you negligence, gross negligence, uh, governing law, what, 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 what are the governing laws that you have around the world? For example, you have the Sharia, you have the common law, you have the civil law. Uh, of course, Sharia is not a commercial law. Sometimes the courts do refer to, especially if you're doing a contract in Saudi or some other country, where uh, the, the courts can refer to and rely on uh, uh, the Sharia. Now, we, we will not be getting into all that, but I just want, I'll be giving an explanation. What is common law, civil law? You know, common law is uh, like US, UK, Australia, most of the countries have common law. Civil law is, is usually, uh, in most of the countries in Africa, Europe, uh, China, uh, South America, all these countries, Mongolia, all these countries uh, have civil law. Uh, so I'll be explaining uh, how, what is the difference and how could, especially when you're dealing in international contracts, what could go wrong if you enter, if a common law country enters, if you're if you're someone from a common law country and you enter into contract with a civil law country, you know, there are, there are issues that crop up uh, when the law followed in, in, in a country which is very different. Uh, could have an impact on the project. So I'll, I'll be speaking on that. Uh, the next next aspect, insurance, I'll be talking about the different types of insurance. Like you have uh, contractors, all risk insurance. I'll be talking about some best practices in understanding, uh, you know, the most important, how do you, how do you read an insurance clause uh, or an insurance policy? There are exclusions to it. There's some things known as an add-on, which you add on to an insurance. It's, it's very, very relevant. Uh, you have the uh, contractors, all risk insurance, CGL insurance, you have, um, you know, fidelity insurance, you have DNO insurance, you have uh, uh, transit insurance. So you have 
a whole list of insurance. Of course, I will not be speaking on all that, but the commercial part of it, I'll be explaining. Like when you are doing project finance, there's something known as deductibles. Uh, how does it work? How do how do uh, the importance of deductibles? How do you arrive at an insurance cost? I'll just give you some pointers. Very very essential as far as commercial contracts are concerned. I will then be speaking about uh, before I move on from the uh, uh, you know the uh, risk transferring clauses. I'll be talking about the representation of warranty clause, which is a very very important clause as far as risk transferring in a contract is concerned. So that is something which I'll be talking about as far as commercial terms and conditions of contract. These terms also help you in reading a tender document. So if you were looking at a tender terms and conditions. And if you really want to excel in understanding how a tender document is prepared, or when you write a proposal, uh, you know, if you are a client, when you write your tender terms and conditions, and if you are if you are a contractor, and if you are responding to the tender, you should know the impact right from the client as from the client perspective and the contractor perspective. So you should understand how it works. Uh, this these clauses will give you an insight, uh, and I, I can share with you something which I share with almost all my participants. If you understand the risk of your business, you are a better manager. I'll repeat what I said. If you understand the risk of your business, you are a better manager, which means if I understand how this, these, are, these are the risk as far as my organization is concerned. These are the clauses that will take care of the risk, some of the risk. These are the things that will transfer the risk. Insurance is, is used as a tool by my organization to mitigate risk. You cannot eliminate risk but it does mitigate risk to some extent. How am I using insurance? Does insurance cover me for all aspects? Is there an exclusion as far as insurance policy is concerned? Now, if you understand all these things in a project, you will understand uh, how a risk has an impact on the project. So all these things will be covered in this module two. Very, very important when you're dealing with construction contract management. Right? Now, what, you, why am I saying not, not because I'm, uh, it's like it's important because this will help you in career progression. I have dealt with a lot of contract managers, construction engineers, contract engineers. And for them, as I said, the more you understand the risk of your business, the better manager. Right? And I'll share with you how, how this is done. Actually. So how do you do? Uh, I'll also share with you some aspects. I'm not sure if I'm sharing in this course. But I'll share with you some aspects of risk management. Uh, how do you prepare yourself? How do you identify, assess, and mitigate risk? So that's something which is very important for all for all those who are dealing with contracts. Because contracts is all about risk, and, and risk can be positive and negative either way, right? But having said that, uh, the second leg or module which talks about commercial terms and conditions very important as far as contracts are concerned. Moving on from here. Uh, I, I think I said I'll be sharing with you some best practices. How do you write a letter of intent? I, I'll share with you a case law where I was personally involved when I was in Norway. Uh, I'll also be sharing with you best practices when you write when you write a letter of intent. And what is the legal position of a letter of intent in contracts or in law? I'll be sharing that with you. MOU is uh, something which uh, you know some of you would be involved, some of you may not be involved. But I'll share with you from the contract perspective. Uh, whether the MOU is an agreement contract, and I'll share with you some tips on you know how to write an MOU. If that is something which you guys are interested on, uh, I can share some aspect of MOU. NDA. Now there was one, of, and there's something very important which I want to share with you. One of my participants uh, who was attending one of my uh, you know training sessions, and the girl was asked whether a non-disclosure agreement is is it an agreement or a contract. And she said it's an agreement, and uh, she lost because the interviewer was expecting the right answer, which is an. So I'll be sharing with you some uh, some tips on NDA. You know what are the risks involved in NDA? How do you best manage your NDA? And uh, what should be what are the red lines that you should look at when you're dealing with an NDA? Uh, I'll I'll share with you as far as NDA is concerned. And uh, you know if you are the disclosing party, what should you put in your NDA that will protect the interest of your bashes? This is something which I'll be sharing with you in this module, which is module number three, which deals with non-disclosure agreement, right? And the challenges and the risk involved as well. Now, NDA is, if you're signing with the foreign party, uh, especially if somebody, if it's someone in Europe or US, uh, you will find that they are very serious when they are negotiating the NDA. So I'll talk about NDA uh, in this module, module number three. Now, module number four talks about scope of work. Now, 
Excuse me. Scope of work. My experience has been as far as uh, uh, commercial contracts are concerned. Scope of work is many times misunderstood between the parties. You know, there is because the language of the scope is not properly understood. Sometimes the scope is not written properly, and uh, I have known. I, I mean, I'll share some uh, very interesting, uh, you know, statement. Like some of the guys who write scope, uh, they use the word including but not limited to in the scope. And some of them said, if when the moment you write this, including but not limited to, means even if I forgot to write something in the scope, uh, you know, this word will cover me for that. Now, that presumption or assumption is absolutely wrong. It does not cover you. Scope. If you write something like this, it does not. It does not cover. So I'll be sharing with you some important elements of how do you write your scope. What should be the language of your scope? Now, I'm not a technical guy, but I can share with you best practices, the language that you should read in a writing your scope, what are the common pitfalls that people write, do when they write their scope, and why scope is important, because your scope is one of the tools which could give rise to claim. Scope can give rise to claim. How does that happen? One of my clients, you know, he said, Manoj, I love, I love the fact that my client is confused and they don't write the scope. Good, good for me as a contractor because I am then able to squeeze money from my client because every time you don't write your scope properly, it's a variation. It's a change order in the contract. And contractors love variation and change order. Right? You make some extra money because of because it's a variation. Now, having said that, uh, you know, very, very important. Scope is one of the pillars of your contract. One of the pillars of your contract. You don't want to mess around with your score. I have known in my experience, you know, almost 60 to 70 percent of your litigation land, your commercial contracts, they land up in litigation or arbitration. The reason is the scope was not written properly. So I'll be sharing with you some best practice, some guidelines. Now, scope, you know, there's no universal rule for writing a scope, but I'll share with you some interesting guidelines. How do you ensure that your company's interest is protected? As far as scope is concerned, writing scope is concerned, language, some best practices as far as writing scope is concerned. So that will be covered in module four, construction, uh, in construction. And, and as I said, uh, this 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 is one of the backbones of your contract. If you go wrong with your scope, chances are, you know, the contract uh, can uh, can go wrong. Right. So that's just something I, I'll share with you. One more aspect of scope that will give an idea how it works. Uh, why scope is important. And then I'll move on from here to the next module. Uh, you know, one, there was a client of mine and they were into construction and they wanted to buy an IT software. You know, for software, uh, you can't live without software nowadays. So they they wanted to buy a software and these IT, these construction guys, uh, most of them had civil engineering knowledge, they went ahead and prepared a scope for IT company. Now, when I have no knowledge about IT, and if I prepare the scope, my scope is bound to go wrong. Take a vice, vice versa situation, where an IT guy, the IT company wants to build a wall. Why do they want to build a wall? Now, IT engineers have no, I would say, no knowledge of civil engineering. And if they prepare the scope, the chances are the scope will go wrong, right? And that is why I said, what, what is the best practice? How do you do it? Now, this is something which I'll share in the course. How do you deal with scope and why it's things go wrong with the scope? Why there is a scope creep or a cost over when, when you're dealing with when you're dealing? Of course, you really, you really can't rule out these two things, but you can minimize that, right? For example, I remember when I was doing a workshop for Qatar Petroleum, in the tender document, Qatar Petroleum QP had written that anything up to 10 percent, the, the contractor has to do the job for you. Anything about 10 percent, the contractor can then raise it as a change order or variation. I, I can share with you my experience. Your scope is uh, is one of the most important things in the contract. So a lot of emphasis on that. right? And I would rec strongly recommend experts to spend some time as far as the language of scope is concerned. 
right? So that's your scope. Now moving on from here, module five talks about commercial contracts. So, you know, these are tools used to minimize risk. If I'm the client, what is my tool to minimize my risk? I will ask my contractor, please give me a performance guarantee, which is usually 10% of the contract. Value. Please give me a bank guarantee, uh, a tender guarantee. I'll explain what tender guarantee is later on. Uh, please give me an advanced bank guarantee. Uh, I'll be, so these are things, tools that I use as a client to ensure that tomorrow things goes wrong, I can I can then notify the bank and the money comes to my into my into my account, right? But having said that, what is the risk involved? If the moment the client invokes the bank guarantee or the performance bank guarantee, PBG or ABG, advanced bank, guarantee, right? Now in that case, your relationship goes for a toss and things could go wrong. You can always have you could always you could also have a claim sitting on your head if things didn't go well. So I'll be sharing with you some practices as far as, and I'll be sharing with you, what is the difference between bond, uh, guarantee, and which one is the right word? Is it, is, should, you, should you be using the word bond or guarantee? And things can, uh, you know, things can go wrong if, it's, uh, if, if you're not using the right word. I'll, I'll, I'll also be talking about retention money. Why do you have retention money clause? I'm sure most of you know that. And I'll also be sharing with you uh, comfort letter, when do you use a comfort letter? When do you give comfort letter to the client if you're a contractor? Uh, LC, I'll also be talking about parent company guarantee. In some client, in some cases, uh, yeah, you can see a parent company guarantee. In some cases where the contractor does not have the right technical uh, skill uh, or the author authorized capital of the contractor is less, uh, the client may then ask for uh, you know, may ask the contractor to come as a consortium and a joint venture partner, and then you can bid together as a, as a JV partner or a consortium partner. Now, in that kind of cases, you know, you will use some of these instruments, a parent company guarantee or a comfort letter uh, to ensure that the company's interest is protected. I'll be speaking about all these things in module five and we run the main course as far as uh, construction contract management is concerned. And then I'll be talking about module six is the type of contracts. Just give me a second. Module six, I'll be talking about, you know, fixed price contract, lump sum contracts, turnkey contracts. There are some, sometimes your LSTK contracts, uh, your EPC contracts are fixed price contract. You know, there's a lot of kind of a lot of terminology which is used, EPCIC, EPCIC. So sometimes it's, it's confusion. All these, some of them are fixed price contracts or lump sum contracts. So I'll be talking about, you know, the risk involved. Who, who gets the maximum, maximum? Who takes the maximum risk? Is it the buyer or seller in a fixed price contract? And when do I use a fixed price contract? I'll be talking about cost reimbursable bond. When do I go for a cost reimbursable What is the risk involved? Who takes the maximum buyer or seller in a cost reimbursable bond? Then you have time and material, TNM contracts, which is not very well known and not liked in the industry. But yes, you have TNM contracts uh, in construction. And sometimes um, I've seen some of my clients who used it. Most of, most of the time it's in IT, uh, but I've seen one of the contracts that we did with Kuwait Oil Company it was based on TNM contract. So I'll be explaining unit rates. Unit rates, also known as BOQ contracts, also known as measured, remeasurable contracts. So I'll be speaking about all these, you know, just giving a brief of what these contracts are, where, how, how does it transfer risk and when do I use this model? And then you have something as NAPMO. And this is just to give you a glimpse of the tech. Now, it's the, now why, why is this module here, module six? The reason is I should know what type of contracts my company enters into. If I don't understand this, I will not be able to see where the risk is. If I don't understand the risk, big problem. Right? So I should know. What type of company, what type of contract does my company enter into? If I'm a contract engineer or a contract manager or a commercial manager, I should know whether it's a fixed price contract, if it's a cost reimbursement, and where is the risk? How do I ensure that my company's interest is protected when I enter into these kind of contracts? So that's something which I'll be sharing with you in module six, very important as far as commercial contracts are concerned. Now, the next one, module seven is IPR. I'll just briefly touch upon IPR. When I say IPR, we will not talk about those trademarks and all those stuff. I'm, I'm going to talk about design rights. So design rights in a, in a construction contract is something which I'm going to speak about 
when we touch upon intellectual property rights as far as commercial. Since we are talking about commercial contracts and construction contracts, so we will limit our, our discussion to design rights. Uh, and uh, I'll be also talking about design liability later on, which is very, very, very interesting topic for all those who are in construction. Now, uh, you then have something as, uh, you know, dealing with variations. Uh, variations also known as change order, as I said. Uh, I'll be sharing with you the impact of variation clause in a contract, uh, how a variation clause is written in a contract, some best practices as far as variation is concerned, uh, you know, some best practices for writing the language of a variation contract. You know, as I said, variation is uh, a highly contested clause uh, when the matter goes to arbitration or litigation, when your construction disputes, they reach uh, arbitration or litigation. So I'll be sharing with you some writing, some good writing practice for as variation is concerned. I will also share with you the impact, you know, for those who have done project management, uh, how variation is measured as far as the triple constraint is concerned. And uh, variation is a very interesting topic. So I'll share with you some best practices on variation, some, some clauses and how some inputs on how to write it, which will ensure that your company's interest is protected. So variation is uh, in, uh, not numbered, but it's module eight. Now, uh, the next one is measuring contract as proper. Those who are from the client perspective, uh, for them, it's uh, measuring contractor performance. And for those who are contractors, measuring the performance of your subcontractor. Now, in commercial contracting, it's very important that you have this clause where you are able to measure the performance of your contractor. If you have not written down the performance standards, it's known as PWS, performance working standards. Uh, if you don't, if you don't write down the performance standard, if you don't, you know, there is an adage in English, that which is not measured, consider it as not done. Right? So if you're not able to measure the performance of your contractor, for those who are contractors here, measure the performance of your subcontractor. If it's a, see what happens when the matter goes to court of law. Some of the guys, they make a statement, you know, the, you know, sometimes when it goes to court, they say they make the statement, the contractor or the client was in breach of contract, contractor was in breach, subcontractor. Now, unless you have written down the KPIs, the key performance indicators, even the judges and the arbitrators, they find it very, they have to then infer what went wrong with the contract and then rely on the evidence, right? So that could be, they have to then rely on the evidence. That could be uh, a dangerous scenario. And, they, and then they have to interpret and infer what could have gone wrong with the contract. You should not, your contract should not be written in that fashion. You should write down the performance indicators. I'll, I'll share with you some inputs. How do you write, how do you write down the performance, uh, you know, uh, work summary or uh, how do you write down those standards? as far as measuring performance of your contractor for those who are contracted, for those who are clients, and those who are contractors here for your subcontractors. This will ensure that your contracts are, I would not say there's nothing as 100 percent, you know, uh, claim proof, but this will ensure that you have minimum claim coming in as far as contract and so construction contract claims are concerned. Now, uh, the module nine, is again very interesting. I will be sharing with you a very interesting topic as to how do you write correspondence, you know, when you write. So sometimes people write in a very different way. So when you get a claim letter, you know, what should you write? Should you admit it or, you know, should you reject it? Or, or like if you if you look at uh, in FIDIC, and when I talk about FIDIC in my next, uh, in, in my next session, you know, uh, as far as the 2017 FIDIC is concerned. Now, all claims are not disputes. I want all of you to pay attention to what I'm saying. All claims are not disputes. Those, so all claims are not disputes. Some of the claims the client will allow. Where the client allows, then there's no, where the client rejects the claim, then it becomes a dispute. But all claims per se, or by very nature of it, does not become a dispute, right? So what I'm going to do in this module nine, the number is not there, but I want you to understand here is I will be sharing with you some best practice. What do you write when you get a claim letter? You know, what should be your first letter that you write down? 
uh, in response to a claim like that. Something with some, some, some nuances which you will get to learn. Not a very big topic, but I've got some four or five important slides which will help you, you know, overcome your, uh, your issues that you deal with claim. Right? Now, in module 10, the next module, I talk about, you know, defects in construction. So like there is something like design deficiencies. Design liability is a very, very important aspect in construction. Who is responsible for the design lab? So, so is it the client or the contractor? If you are an APC contractor, sometimes a client would say, you know, if they, I'm sure most of you have heard of the, the feed, F-E-E-D, right? Front-end engineering design. Now, sometimes the client would then insist, they hire a consultant to prepare the feed and the client will then ask the contractor to endorse the feed. Right? So sometimes there's a clause in the contract which says, client, even if the client approves the design, tomorrow there's something flaw, some flaw, contractor would be responsible. And I'll also be talking about what is a FIDIC position as for design liability. So that's very important. So design liability is something which in construction contract, you cannot ignore. You cannot say, oh, I, can't, I, don't, I can't deal with this. This is something which you should be aware of. And I'll be sharing with you how in construction contracts, you can deal with design liability. And uh, you know, what are the tools which will protect the interest of your company as far as design liability is concerned. Material deficiencies, specification problems, uh, very important latent defects. I'll explain patent defects. There is a provision in uh, the 2017 uh, Red Book. 1999, it was not there, latent defect, but now you have some provision for latent defect. And then you have defects notification period, which I'm sure all of you know. I'll share some one or two minor tips over there. Defects liability period. Again, uh, this is the legal period once the defects notification period. So I'll explain that. And there is something beautiful in construction contracts known as decennial liability. If you are dealing in a civil law country, you will be dealing with this concept, which is known as decennial liability, right? So I'll explain that too, very interesting. Uh, and different countries have different uh, ways of dealing with this. For those who are in construction contracts, you cannot ignore this topic, decennial liability, especially when you're doing international contracts, right? Then there are some key issues uh, when you're dealing with uh, construction claims your extension of time, program and records. Uh, this is a big uh, concept, time is the essence and time at large, right? So this is something which I will uh, which I'll share with you guys because this is again, uh, an interesting topic as far as construction contracts are concerned and highly debatable when it comes to time at large. So explain that concept. BOQ, I think I explained design error. I think it's there uh, when I spoke about design liability. Termination, BOQ, I said this, I wrote this BOQ in model in this module is sometimes you have this ENOE, errors and omissions in a BOQ clause. How do you deal with that? Uh, is something which would be there in that, uh, in, in the BOQ which we'll be talking about here. Disruption, how do you deal with disruption and cost of claims preparation? When the matter goes to arbitration, litigation, uh, you know, who would take the cost? Um, and that's something which, okay. I will also be talking about in the next module, uh, as far as the delay is concerned. So I'll be talking about causes of delay. This is very important, excusable, non-excusable delays, acceleration, concurrent delay, the position of concurrent delay in FIDIC, float, uh, you know, and what is required for a successful delay claim. Now, I'm not a forensic expert as far as delay claims are concerned, but I'll be sharing with you uh, from the contractual point of view, how, how best can you protect the interest of the company uh, as far as delay claims are concerned. And I'll, I'll also be sharing with you some inputs on from, as far as program and records, time is the essence is concerned. You know, the earlier module uh, from, what does the Society for Construction Law, what do they recommend as far as, uh, you know, program and records and time is the essence is concerned. So that is something which I'll share with you guys uh, when we run the main course as far as, uh, and these are very important as far as delay claims are concerned. I'll be explaining uh, acceleration, flow, and recommendations. Excuse me. And recommendations to avoid. Now, claims arising out of delay. So that's, that's one aspect of your construction contract management. Now, the next thing that I would be talking about is 
the most frequent clauses which give rise. This is again, uh, this is from Fiddick. This is not my own creation. I'll be talking about, uh, you know, unforced now claims that arise. You will find most of the construction contracts arising out of uh, these four or five points. Like one is unforeseeable physical condition, um, unforeseen events, right of access to site is something which I'll explain to you. Uh, right of access to site does not mean building access to site, to site, but the day the contractor is given possession of the site, that's right of access to site. Uh, delayed drawings, adjustment for change in legislation and commencement of work. All these things are uh, the core of your construction contracts and claims. So this is something which, uh, which I'll be covering in the main course as far as construction contracts. And FIDIC, I've not put the FIDIC uh, course outline here, uh, but I'll share with you when I cover FIDIC, which is in, if you guys are interested in the next session, I'll take you to the course outline, which talks about a brief history of FIDIC. And then it talks about the role of engineer, uh, the 2017 changes which were made, some of the changes that were, you know, the important changes that were, which FIDIC made from 19, from in the 2017 edition in the Red Book. Um, I'll also be talking about, uh, uh, you know, the claim notification process as far as FIDIC is concerned. So uh, DAB, uh, which is very important, the Dispute Adjudication Board, uh, and in the 2017, it's now DAAB, Dispute, uh, Dispute Avoidance Adjudication Board. So I'll be talking about all this stuff when we talk about FIDIC, uh, which is again going to be very interesting when you guys join me uh, on the 15th of March for this one-hour session. But before we, before I take questions, let me take this opportunity of explaining one concept to you, which I'm sure will, you will find it very interesting as far as construction contracts are concerned. Now, which is liquidated damages. I'll explain that concept for you guys. Uh, since you guys have taken the pain to join this session, so it's worth uh, going through one slide, which I want to share with you. And that's a very interesting slide. And let me go back to, I hope all of you can see my screen. I can just go back to, now, in construction contract, this is one of the uh, slides which I'll be sharing with you when I run the course. And I thought, let me take one course. I have, I think I have some 10 to uh, eight minutes, eight to nine minutes for explaining this slide. And then we will take any question in Q and A uh, uh, as far as this course is concerned, introductory courses. So now let's, let me explain what liquid damage is. I'm sure most of you, most of you are aware of uh, how uh, the liquid damages clause works. Now, if you look at liquidated damages, the definition of LD, LD is known as, you know, I'll, I'll share with you, for those who are listening to me, uh, for those who can see in the chat box, LD is, uh, you know, is known as LAD in, in some countries, which is liquidated a certain damages, LAD. Liquidated a certain damage, LAD. Construction contracts known as delay damages in some cases. And for those from procurement background, it's some people call it as price discount. Now you may wonder why it is called as price discount, but I've known some of my clients use for LD, they use the word price discount. Right? Now I want you to understand the definition of LD, liquid damages or delay damages. Now, LD is not penalty, right? It's just a debtor. I'm, it's a genuine, the definition of LD is a genuine pre-estimation of my loss. A genuine pre-estimation of my loss, right? And it can be levied only two times, late delivery and late performance. This is the, and you will see that uh, in your tender document, in fact, in the FIDIC, if you see the last pages, it will show in the appendix to the tender, uh, this LD clause is there, which is usually up to five to 10 percent of the contract value. You know, it's, there's a limit to your LD. It's not something like unlimited. It's, there's a limit to your LD, so it's it's got limit. Now, I want to explain how it works. So let me give you an example. When I say, 
late performance. So let me go back to my screen. All right, so if there's a project, so let's say 1st of Jan is the start date of the project. You guys can please excuse me for my writing. I don't write well and I don't draw well. I'm using my finger. And 31st December is the completion date, right? And here you have, let's say some milestones, which the contractor is supposed to meet. But if there's a delay here, delay here, delay, and if there's a delay here, here, anyway, just observe. up to 10 person, the client will levy an LD, which is in the tender document, in the appendix to the tender, it will say, uh, you know, 500 AD per day. Something like that. Right? But up to a percentage. That is how your LD with delay in performance, this is what it means. And delay in delivery. So delay in delivery, suppose if I, I, there's an excavation machine which I'm buying. Right? There's an excavation machine which I'm buying. The delivery date, so the, as per the contractors, uh, the supplier schedule, the, the machine was to reach to me by, uh, let's say today, 8th of March. And the contract, the supplier delayed it and he supplied to 15th of March. So in that kind of a scenario, you will, you will ensure late delivery. There would be an LD levied by the client. Now, remember when I said price discount. So what 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 do one what did one of my clients did they did actually? So the price of the equipment is hundred dollar. Let's say hundred US dollar. <clears throat> so what did the client? So they they call it as price discount again. This is liquid damages. They said you have to deliver by Jan. The delivery date is Jan. If you deliver by Feb. I'll pay you $90. If you deliver by March, I'll pay you $80. Of course, it does not become zero. But this is how the LD is, you know, they say, okay, this is what I'm good. Now, I want to share with you something very nice when I talk about LD cross. And before I wind up for the day, and then I uh, will keep it an open floor for you guys to raise, answer, you know, if you have any question. A smart contractor will always load his LD price in the contract, in the contract piece. Right? This is not something this, the contractor can see because, you know, not everything goes in a straight line. It's not possible for everything like your delivery can be happening. You know, it's not like every day you reach your office on time. It's not possible. There are days when you will get late to office because of the traffic on the road. Right? So the a smart contractor on, and also envisage there are days where I could be late in performance or delivery. And what does he do? Some aspect of his LD is LD cost, which the contractor with the client puts, it gets loaded into the contract price. For those who are into pricing will agree with me, this is how an LD clause is written in a contract. You will see this in the tender document in your book. In the, in the if I, I can share that in the FIDIC book. You have, as I said, it's a, it could be a day rate, it could be a weekly rate or a monthly rate whatever has been agreed between the parties, right? And as I said, LD is a genuine free estimation. So let me explain that once again. We, I think we have a few minutes. So let's say I see a name, Hani here. So I give a contract to Hani to build a bridge from point A to point B, right? And I say, Hani, you're supposed to give me this bridge by 1st of Feb, right? Now, because the reason is, if Hani gives me this bridge by 1st of Feb, I can put my toll booth. All of you know a toll booth? A toll booth. Like in Dubai, we have something, a Salik, they collect money from the, for using the bridge. Salik, I don't know if you guys, I'm sure some of you know that. Right? So if I have to collect money here, and because Hani has delivered the, the bridge to me on 1st of March, 
I suffered loss. I was expecting 5,000 vehicles or cars will use this bridge. I'm going to charge $1. So my I'm expecting a loss of $5,000 per day into 28. The number up to a up to a limit. But this is my genuine pre-estimation. I'm this is my loss which I've suffered because honey has given me this bridge by in March or you know whatever 500 into 30. Sorry. Right. So I want you to understand this is how your LD clause works in a commercial country. Right. Now, having said that, I think I'm pretty much done with our introductory coastline. And I also shared with you the 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 impact of uh, your LD clause in commercial contracts. Now, if you guys have any questions, if you guys have any questions, you can put in a chat box, and I'll be more than happy to take your questions. Or, Mohammed, you can whatever. Maybe ten minutes. We can wait for ten minutes, five ten minutes here and there. Um, I think now we are ready to receive your questions and uh, get you an answers. If you have any comments or questions, we will be happy to uh, listen to them. Uh, if you have questions, you can write it down in the chat or raise your hand. And Mr. Manoj will be happy to answer it. I will check also LinkedIn that we might have a question in the comments. Uh, NAPNOP is uh, no agreement on price, uh, no contract. That's NAPNOP. I'm checking right. LinkedIn. Uh, is... Anybody else? If you have any question in the chat box, feel free to drop me. I'm here to help you guys as far as your questions are concerned. Uh, you can write it down in Arabic and I will try, try to translate it, no, no problem, okay. uh, if you are shy to say it in, Eng in English. I'm still checking LinkedIn, there is a lot of comments, so just a second. Somebody so, has said, what is the difference between measured and uh, it's it's more or less the same measured and remeasured contracts. Measure is if I have used, you know, five bricks, five cases, so I'm going to measure it. And, uh, you know, sometimes an interim payment is released and then after you again do a remeasurement and it's, 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 just, it's more or less synonymous, but you could have two angles to it actually. You measure it, sometimes you again remeasure the work. Uh, before you uh, make some some more payment to the contractor, and that's where it would be remission. So until we receive a question, if you can give us a brief about text lecture content, that would be nice from you, Mr. Manoj. I think I said, uh, Mohammed, just explain to them that we will be talking about uh, the FIDIC conditions of the contract, introduction to FIDIC. We'll talk about the role of engineer. Uh, we're talking about uh, the contractor obligations as far as FIDIC is concerned. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about some aspects of uh, the 2017 changes in the FIDIC red book. Uh, I'll be giving you a comparison metrics. What is the when do you use a red book, yellow book, green book, uh, gold book, white book, blue book? The you know so all those books. Uh, what is the best time? What is the best book that you should you should use it for your industry? Uh, I'll be talking about uh, you know FIDIC claims, claims the claim process as far as FIDIC is concerned. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, the the uh, the PC conditions in a contract. How should your tender document look like as far as FIDIC is concerned? And lastly, and the most important thing, I'll be talking about dispute adjudication board. Very very important. Or the DAAB, dispute avoidance adjudication board. So a lot of things, interesting things that will happen when we talk about FIDIC, and the, the course will again help you in your career progression because it's a very nice topic. I know a friend of mine who lost his job interview again. 
when he was asked, you know, to explain the Vedic books. Right. So very interesting. Very interesting. And I'm sure you guys will learn uh, a lot from that uh, workshop that we'll do on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Manoj. I think we had uh, we have another okay. question here. It's regarding the EOT extension of time calculation details. I guess that's far away from our topic and it's a specific topic. Uh, if you wish to talk about it or uh, we can discuss it later, you feel free, Mr. Manoj. I think it's related okay. to extension of time. Uh, yes. the delay analysis. Extension of time? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, so extension of time, I'll be sharing with you some inputs as far as uh, you know what the Society of Construction talks about. Uh, as far as extension of time, so Society for Construction Law, which is based in UK. So I'll share some inputs as far as extension of time when we do the lecture. I have a question on waiver of subrog subrogation is a very interesting topic. I'll talk about waiver of subrogation. That will take me some time to explain. But yes, you can ask your contractors, the subcontractors copy uh, to check if there is a waiver of subrogation. I'll explain this when we do the course. Because subrogation is a little bit topic and I'll share with you some interesting case laws, which I experienced when I was an in-house lawyer. Uh, if the delay is due to the subcontractor, will the LD be imposed on him or on the main contractor? Uh, you know, in, in a contract which is a back to buy contract, uh, if uh, the client levies an LD on the contractor, the contractor will just pass it on to the subcontractor. So it's like it's got an effect. So the contractor would be impacted, contractor will then pass on the liability. Since it's a back to buy, all the main terms and conditions of the contract is passed on to the subcontractor by the main contractor. So yes, contractor will also get impacted by the LD, but then uh, he will pass it on to the subcontractor. Um, if you allow me, Mr. Manoj, I will give a brief about uh, EOT calculation just in one minute. Please. Uh, <laughs> as you know, I am actually a planner and I used to, to do delay analysis techniques. Uh, let's say generally we have two methods for delay analysis, prospective analysis and retrospective analysis. One is concerned about looking forward before the event occurs, and the other is to talks about looking back after the event occurred. You have two, uh, four major uh, ways for delay analysis or four categories. Let's say if we are talking about prospective analysis uh, or we are looking forward, we have time impact analysis, we have impacted as planned. If we are looking back or in a retrospective analysis, we use two, uh, two methods, as planned versus as built and as built but for. Each technique is used based on some questions or some uh, points to select. Uh, the analysis method, depending on how much details we had and what is the governing law, what the contract says, uh, there is some points we can uh, some points we can pick or choose the best method for us. Uh, I think uh, SCL Society of Construction Law uh, determined this uh, points very clear. Uh, of course, each type of uh, delay analysis. Um, has its own calculation and its own techniques and its own complications. Uh, let me give you a fast brief about the major question on how to choose uh, the right uh, delay analysis technique. And let's say uh, what we need for a delay analysis te technique is to measure how much delay occurred in the project, depending on uh, who uh, who was uh, responsible for the delay and what is the cause and what is the effect for each uh, event. And if we start talking about uh, delay analysis, we had to talk about concurrency and disruption and float and critical bus. So that's why I said uh, from the beginning, this is not the, the suitable lecture for this uh, because it's another topic and it needs more details. Uh, finally, I will just give the right question if you want to ask yourself about uh, how to choose the best method for delay analysis. You have to ask yourself uh, the following eight questions, and it's uh, extracted from SCL Delay Protocol, Society of Construction Law. The first thing is the relevant conditions of the contract. Is it mention any uh, delay analysis technique? And the nature of the causative events, uh, was it complicated or not, uh, concurrency or not? Uh, the nature of the project, is it a huge mega project 
or uh, complex project. Uh, the next question is to injure a, a proportionate approach, the value of the project or dispute, because sometimes uh, or some delay analysis techniques requires more efforts, more time, which calculated to, of course, more money. So if the dispute is not huge, you don't have to use uh, some techniques, you have to omit them. Or the case is not complicated, it's just two or three events, or the delay is one month or less than, so you don't have to go further in your uh, investigation. The time available, sometimes you don't have time to, uh, to make uh, some certain type of delay analysis uh, for a question uh, as built but for. It's a very complicated technique. Sometimes we use Windows analysis or slice. Uh, the next question is the nature, extent, and the quality of the records available. If you don't have records, you don't have to make delay analysis or you cannot make delay analysis or for uh, to be accurate, you can't make an accurate delay analysis. The nature, extent, the, the quality of the program information available, and finally, the forum in which the assessment is being made. This is some questions extracted from SCCL regarding choosing the uh, best delay analysis, and sorry for, uh, for being uh, too much talkative about this. Uh, I think there is a final question here. Will the course cover risk management in construction to which extent? Uh, this question is for you, of course, Mr. Manoj. Uh, yeah, uh, of course, risk management is a very, uh, it's a very big topic. But briefly, I'll be talking about some aspects of risk management. Uh, you know, how do you deal with the risk? Uh, how do you identify risk, assess risk, um, mitigate risk? How do you deal with uh, issues as far as contingency is concerned? And how do you monitor it and assess the risk on a continuous basis? One of my clients were doing that in, in their project. And uh, if you monitor and you know keep uh, you know updating yourself as a risk is concerned, you know during the course of the contract, uh, that makes a word. But coming back to your question, not the entire aspect, but here's a brief aspect of just to give you an insight as to how uh, well, how do corporates look at risk and how you can manage your risk. So that we will cover. Thank you, Mr. Manoj. Uh, I think we came to the end. Uh, there's no question right now. Uh, thank you everyone for attending our free webinar. Uh, I'm reminding you that we have another one next week at the same time, 6.30 Egypt local time and Indian local time, Mr. Uh, Manoj. Uh, I think we add five or four, four hours and a half. Uh, yes. We will be waiting for you next lecture, uh, inshallah. Um, and peace be upon you, everyone. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Goodbye, everyone. Bye bye. Have a nice weekend. Bye bye.